Good evening, everybody. It's eight o'clock, and uh, happy New Year to one and all, and welcome to the first episode of Marvelous Medicine of 2022. Uh, I have great pleasure in uh, welcoming and Dr. Murlidhar Rajagopalan and Dr. N. Anand, who uh, very kindly consented to do this uh, program at an extremely short notice. Uh, normally, I give my speakers and moderators a few weeks' notice. But due to some unforeseen circumstances, the program had to be changed. So I'm uh, extremely thankful for Murli for uh, being my knight in shining armor. Uh, quick introduction for Dr. Nath Anand, who's going to moderate the session. He's a consultant dermatologist at Kaveri Hospital, Chennai. And he runs Skin Research Center and RV Diagnostic Center in Chennai with his wife. He did his MBBS uh, Diploma in Dermatology and MD Dermatology at Jipma Pondicherry. He also did his DNB in Dermatology and Venereology. He's a visiting faculty in several medical colleges in Chennai. His uh, areas of interest are uh, dermatopathology, photodermatology, and management of psoriasis, vitiligo, and autoimmune blistering disorders. Anand is an avid runner, and he's completed several full and half marathons. Like he said before, he's a trustee of Dream Runners and is the head of Bessie Runners, avidly promoting and guiding new joinees to take up long distance running. Uh, welcome Anand and uh, would you please make the introductions for uh, Murli. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you. First, I'm not with any hospital, <laughs> including mm -hmm. Kaveri. I just admit cases in Chennai, Meenakshi. I'm on my own, full time on my own. I've become much more relaxed in the last few years. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, now, I don't think if, uh, any of you needs introduction to Murli. He's the, one of the most well-known, if not the well, most well-known dermatologist across India and in many parts of the world. In a way, when I joined in 1985, when I joined MBBS, uh, Murli was in the double batch. Don't know whether he remembers ragging me for some time. And subsequently, sometime in uh, 1988, when we had used to have a posting in dermatology those days during MBBS, so I kind of fell in love with dermatology and then did a little bit of background and uh, realized that a person called Murlida Rajgopal threw away his medicine to change, become a dermatologist par excellence. And there's no, that's the only word I can use. Uh, he, in fact, the medicine is, I heard him tell me once that people should do a little bit of medicine before doing dermatology and it's of immense help. And I tell you, you know, his work, it shows in his work because he's so, so good in his internal medicine. And it's, uh, that's what helps him enormously in dermatology. Of course, there's not a, any dermatologist in India who doesn't know Murli. Everybody knows him. More importantly, he occupies several chairs. And very proud to say that he got uh, recently selected to be, I think, recently, right, in the Atopic Dermatitis Board of uh, International Society. And proud to say he's the first Indian to be in this position. I don't think there's any other Indian in this. He's the first Indian to be in that position. And that's the kind of work is. I always think of him as an exceptional and knowledgeable guy. It's very difficult to, you know, he has set a benchmark. Once upon a time, Tony Cozier remarked that, you know, um, this uh, bowler, what's our fast bowler, uh, West Indian fast bowler, uh, Malcolm, uh, Michael Holding, was called the Rolls Royce of fast bowling. Murli is the Rolls Royce of dermatology. He set the benchmark very, very high. And it's for all of us to catch up. So I'm very sure he will bridge the gap for you medical general people to understand where we stand in psoriasis today. I would not uh, add anything on it. I'm just waiting and just waiting to hear Murli talk about it. Over to you, Murli. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vidya. And thank you very much, Anand. Vidya, especially, thank you for calling me a knight in shaming or the shining armor. Never been called that in my life. <laughs> Came on the most unlikely situation. Thank you. But thank you for having me here, Vidya. Uh, been following your programs. And uh, I think this is a good uh, forum you all are having. And uh, grateful to be here. Uh, I know Anand for many years. But uh, Anand, I don't remember ragging you. And uh, you know, ragging is a good way of you know, becoming good friends. Uh, looks like uh, I have forgotten that. So uh, it's good fun. And uh, 
I am however grateful to you for your kind words. The reason why I chose today is because Vidya gave me a free hand to choose some topic which I wanted. And the reason why I chose this topic on psoriasis is because I work for the International Psoriasis Council. I represent India there. I've been there now for the past 15 years. So now I'm uh, heading their uh, division of education and uh, started their master classes and fellowship programs for the IPC. The uh, atopic dermatitis thing came up later and uh, it's only because of uh, basic interest in immunology, which puts me there. Having said that, if uh, you would give me permission, I would like to share my sc screen with you. <clears throat> now, in today's uh, discussion, uh, I'm probably going to spend about 45 minutes, that's how much time Vidya told me, uh, on psoriasis. Uh, we thought we label it as psoriasis more than skin deep. I mean, when we were, uh, Anand will also remember when we were all in doing our MD, uh, no one used to talk about psoriasis as being a systemic disease, but uh, it's time we recognize that psoriasis is a systemic disease, and rather it's a marker of several problems and issues that could be happening internally. I do remember that when I joined Apollo, I work at Apollo Hospitals now, and uh, I head the department there. So when I joined, they used to call me for these cardiothoracic surgeons used to call me to screen patients uh, prior to surgery. And they had, a, uh, uh, the, they had a package. And in this package, uh, patients were admitted for just uh, seven days for the entire bypass. And invariably, I would find in at least 20 to 30% of patients, I'm talking about the 90s, uh, many of the slides I'm going to show you belong to the 2000, late uh, 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 post 2000. But in the 90s itself, we could see that there were a lot of them who were psoriatics. And uh, it did strike me, and I wanted to Apollo to start a registry. Um, well, uh, there are dreams, and uh, this still remains a dream. And we will end with that. But uh, the point here I'm making is that this is an extremely complex subject. Uh, this picture, I, I love photography. This is something which uh, I put up in my CV slide. I really love photography. If there's anything I love more than dermatology is photography. And uh, this is from Florence and it's an intricate uh, church over there. The uh, amount of detail that goes into each and every little aspect of this is no match to what happens in psoriasis. My conflict of interest statement is important since I am on the international advisory boards of all the major multinationals because I belong to the IPC. I am even here, I'm speaking on behalf of the IPC who are in psoriasis research and primary drug development. I've spoken for most of the companies on newer concepts on in drug usage and for the IPC and SPIN. Uh, SPIN is the newer uh, uh, formulation where we realized that psoriasis and atopic dermatitis were two sides of the same coin. So instead of calling it a psoriasis interest network, it was called as systemic inflammation in psoriasis and called a spin. This talk is not influenced by these associations. However, what am I going to do in this talk? I'm going to look at the implications of psoriasis on the general health and other internal organs. I'm going to basically talk about what a non-dermatologist should know. Dermatologists like Anand are excellent clinicians and physicians, and they know whatever I'm going to be speaking, but the audience we are addressing today is primarily non-dermatologic audience. And we are going to talk about uh, the comorbid conditions that we see in psoriasis, which affect practically every organ. And therefore, one needs to be alert and not just dismiss psoriasis as 
just some damp skin disease. It's a multi-system inflammatory disorder. It has significant comorbidities. Notable comorbidities are cardiometabolic. Now, when we talk about cardiometabolic comorbidities, we are talking about fairly serious conditions here. Now, my mentor for psoriasis is a gentleman by the name of Alan Mentor. And uh, he's at the University Medical Center Psoriasis Clinic in Dallas, in Texas. He was the man who got me into psoriasis in the late 90s. And uh, I'm very grateful to him. This is a slide that he lent me, uh, pictures of the patients that he sees. And uh, we had done a little uh, program and he's in fact the founder of the International Psoriasis Council. Uh, we were trying to address this question of can we target specific therapies to specific psoriatic phenotypes or genotypes, that is the pharmacogenomics. This was part of that lecture. So we, uh, this is a slide from his collection. I'm not going to be boring you with the details of treatment. I will, however, be talking to you about all these various types of psoriasis, which all of you know, and you've seen, and there are many phases of psoriasis. You can even get lesions on the soles. You can get lesions which sometimes people mistake as ringworm or fungal infections. You have lesions on the scalp. You have lesions on the fingertips, uh, which is very difficult to treat. And uh, nowadays it's being mistaken for the hand eczema that occurs frequently because of excessive paranoid use of sanitizers due to the COVID situation. And you have psoriatic arthritis. Psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis go hand in hand, whether it is dactylitis or enthesitis. Look at this over here in the Achilles tendon. You can see the fullness. It's very easy to make out that there is going to be involvement of the joints once you see a fullness over here. If you really cannot make it out, if you do an ultrasound or a normal appearing Achilles tendon in a psoriatic patient, you will be able to make it out. The reason why we are talking about this is we do not want our patients to have problems like this. I've had several patients who've had a destruction of the distal interphalangeal joints, and that makes their quality of life miserable, and it has a serious socioeconomic burden. Dermatologists invariably see these patients first because the joint involvement may uh, succeed the onset of psoriasis by even five to 10 years. And even patients may not realize that they had a patch on the scalp or in the gluteal region. And uh, many times, even rheumatologists don't look at the connection. We have seen this happening. The key message I was, uh, you know, there is a statement that uh, fools rush in where angels dare to tread. Uh, I was the fool who started uh, using biologics and psoriasis in India way back in 2003. At that time, I was condemned as being somebody who is getting rid of a good drug like methotrexate. But now today we know that not using a biologic in a patient with moderate to severe psoriasis can produce deformities of the joints, decrease the quality of life, make a patient prone to heart attacks, strokes, and early death, all of which are statistically validated. Not to talk about the psychiatric problems, depressions, suicides that happen. You will be very surprised to know that next to cancer, the highest incidence of suicide for a medical condition is psoriasis. This was an interesting paper by Rapp. And uh, the quality of life for a psoriatic patient is miserable and no good doctor should allow this to happen to his patient. When you look at the pathophysiology, this is a very complicated cartoon. So I'm not going to sit and go through every little bit, but we have probably identified a putative antigen. And we know today that it is probably an autoimmune disease. It's a what we call as a type one autoimmune disease. And uh, through uh, tumor necrosis factor, it stimulates the myeloid dendritic cells, which in turn invites a cascade of pH 
one and Ts Th17 and Th22 cells, which produce cytokines like IL-22 and IL-17, which impact the skin, producing keratinocyte proliferation, a resistance to infections, uh, chemokines get released and poly polymorphonucleus uh, cells intervene. And you have Th17 cells which come in and there is a synergistic pro-inflammatory effect. Now, based upon which cytokine you are targeting, you have specific drugs and the list is very broad. We are not going to talk about these drugs today. So rest assured, in the next, I have another 30 slides to show you. I won't be talking about these drugs. I, will only, I only brought this to tell you that, you know, uh, we need to be familiar with DNF-alpha, interleukin-17, and interleukin-23, which are the most important cytokines in psoriasis today. And we'll see how that makes a difference to the general system itself. The comorbidities in psoriasis are strongly associated with disease duration and severity. Psoriatic arthritis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, in fact, a patient of psoriasis who's not even received methotrexate, most probably, especially if he's obese, would already have NASH. So it's important for us to evaluate the liver in a much better manner and not rely on hepatotoxic drugs in patients with psoriasis. The metabolic syndrome is very common. Psychiatric morbidity I just spoke about, about increased risk of depression and suicide. Inflammatory bowel disease, especially Crohn's disease is very common and cardiovascular and cardiometabolic disease. Interestingly, if you look at registries, 32% of psoriasis patients had at least one comorbidity, 10% had at least two, and another 8% had more than three comorbid conditions. Now, this is phenomenally important because it means that if a dermatologist is just going to dismiss a psoriasis patient with coal tar and uh, methotrexate, he's not going to be looking at what is happening inside and the patient may end up for a bypass surgery or end up with a stroke. So we need to be aware of this and that's the whole purpose of this uh, discussion we are having today. So we call this as the psoriatic march where obesity, psoriasis, smoking and alcohol dependence have an interplay. They're all associated, produce systemic inflammation and we have heard in one of the previous uh, uh, lectures and discourses in this marvelous medicine program on insulin resistance. Please remember that inflammation and psoriasis, which contributes to systemic inflammation, produces insulin resistance. I'll just dive, diverge for a moment over here. The insulin resistance can be documented in an almost 60 to 70% of psoriasis patients. And if you treat a patient of psoriasis with infliximab, which is a TNF-alpha blocker, within two hours, the insulin resistance comes down. That's, it's as effective as that, but we do not advocate infliximab for treating diabetes. Maybe sometime in the future, people will find a common drug to treat both diabetes and psoriasis. Insulin resistance is a direct uh, harbinger of endothelial dysfunction atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction. So this is what happens in cardiometabolic disease. Now, this is the psoriatic march. We spoke about obesity. We spoke about, uh, we are going to talk a little more about uh, uh, the metabolism in psoriatic patients and cardiovascular diseases I touched upon, but you're going to talk more in detail. I touched upon diabetes and uh, Hypertension, dyslipidemia, and smoking, they all contribute once again to cardiovascular disease. So there is a vicious loop over here in our psoriatic patients. And this is all the more so in patients who have developed psoriatic arthritis. So if you look at this, there are shared inflammatory mediators which provide the link between psoriasis and common comorbid conditions. So there are inflammatory mediators which are produced in various tissues, which contribute to the system of systemic burden of inflammation. So whether it is psoriasis, 
neurological disorders, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, or arthritis, there is an auto-inflammatory loop. And that is why we find that as time passes, the more we neglect psoriasis patients from an internist's point of view, every dermatologist should be an internist. And if you neglect that, then you are going to pick up more and more comorbid conditions or your patient is going to leave you because he'll probably end up with a stroke or a cardiac problem. And after that, psoriasis is forgotten completely. So this is what actually happens to psoriasis patients. So picture I took about two weeks ago and the lion's share of psoriasis is cardiovascular risk. Now, there is what we call as MACE events, that is major adverse cardiovascular events. Now, this happens in psoriatic arthritis patients and even chronic psoriatic patients. But psoriatic arthritis appears significantly associated with subclinical atherosclerosis. There is endothelial dysfunction. The standard cardiovascular risk factors contribute to the increased risk of MACE. Ogdi reported that the risk of developing MACE is higher in patients with psoriatic arthritis who were not using the, even the standard DMARDs. Forget about biologicals, but even the standard DMARDs, if they were not using it, the cardiovascular risk was much higher. So irrespective of the classical cardiovascular risk factors, the systemic inflammation, that systemic, not systematic, the systemic inflammation of psoriatic arthritis plays an important role in increasing cardiovascular diseases. So even if there is no risk factor, if, even if a patient does not have a metabolic syndrome, even if a patient is not a smoker or an alcoholic or an ethanolic, whatever, I have got to be politically correct here. And uh, we find that they have increased risk of cardiovascular diseases and that's been proven. Now, what is the evidence that a psoriatic plaque is equivalent to an atherosclerotic plaque? This is something really fabulous, which my internist friends over there will understand. There are several cytokines or chemokines involved in psoriatic arthritis. By interacting with specific platelet receptors, they cause intracellular calcium and mobilization, nucleotide secretion, and platelet activation. So this is the synergism between inflammation and atherothrombosis. Mino et al. evaluated platelet aggregability in 114 psoriatic arthritis patients. He looked at this with a tool which is called as the maximal light transmittance, that is the max A percent. The max A percent values of psoriatic arthritis patients who achieved the minimal disease activity during treatment with the TNF blocker were comparable to controls, and they were significantly lower than those of individuals with active disease. What does the sentence mean? This means that the platelet aggregation came down once you gave a TNF alpha blocker. So the risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke came down when you used a, a biological like a TNF alpha blocker. I promised you I won't talk about the method of using biologicals, but this is important here to understand how the use of a drug for psoriasis is going to impact the heart and impact the longevity of the patient. Now, this is another fantastic uh, cartoon which I would really like to share with you. On the left side of your screen, you see a psoriatic plaque. And since there is so much inflammation happening there, we told you about interleukin-12 and 23. Interleukin-12 stimulates the Th1 pathway and interleukin-23 stimulates the Th17 pathway. And both of them impact the skin to produce keratinocyte activation, proliferation and intralesion uh, angiogenesis through TNF-alpha, interleukin-17, interleukin-23, 22, and the down-regulation of the T-regulatory cells. Now look at the right side of the screen. If you look at the right side of the screen, what do we find? The cytokines are absolutely similar. Same types of interleukins, same pathways, same cytokines, same down-down regulation, same plaque growth, and due to the TH17 effect, there is plaque instability and rupture 
which can lead a thrombus away from a blood vessel somewhere and probably it gets lost in the brain and the patient presents with stroke. So psoriasis and atherosclerosis have similar underlying, why similar? I would say absolutely identical underlying immunologic mechanisms. And this was discovered by dermatologists in 2018. I think dermatologists have a lot to be proud about, but they should work more in uh, cohesion with internists. But uh, there is a tendency to shy away from working with internists, and there is a big tendency towards working only on cosmetology or cosmetic dermatology. Not that it's bad, it's good money, but uh, I think in the interests of science, dermatologists need to work closely with internists. Now here I've just listed all the cytokines. You don't need to bother about this, but we spoke about the various types of uh, comorbid conditions like obesity, hypertension, what is happening in the blood vessels, the liver, arthritis. We spoke about the auto-inflammatory loop and we spoke about skin inflammation. You know, all these cytokines are shared in all these areas. So this is what we just wanted to show that psoriasis overlaps everything. And this is a very interesting diagram. Uh, way back in 2009 in uh, hepatology, it was, this, it was discussed. The prevalence of NASH in psoriasis patients versus the controls. Look at the controls who didn't have psoriasis and look at patients with psoriasis. You can see the incidence of NASH. And second, if you look at the disease severity, if the psoriasis activity and severity index, which means the uh, extent of psoriasis is less, then it was much lesser. But if the psoriasis was more extensive, the incidence of NASH was much higher, which meant that these patients are usually in traditional Indian, I would say 98% of Indian dermatologists rely upon methotrexate, but they use methotrexate for severe psoriasis but we do not evaluate these patients for NASH. And if they have NASH, they are going to end up with hepatotoxicity, which could be permanent. There is an increased prevalence of non-cardiovascular comorbidities like arthritis. I mentioned Crohn's disease. I will once again take an aside and mention something more about Crohn's disease here. It's important for us to understand that psoriatic patients may have underlying inflammatory bowel disease because I've been hammering at the fact that biologicals do help us to control comorbid conditions. But here the choice of the biological also makes a difference because in Crohn's disease, a biological like a TNF alpha blocker, which is called etanercept, is going to make it worse. Whereas an IL-17 blocker is going to make it better. It, in fact, using a TNF alpha blocker like etanercept may unmask Crohn's disease in some psoriasis patients. There's a question from Ravi Shankar. Yes, the controls were matched for obesity, Dr. Ravi. I can send you the paper. I'll be answering the questions wherever possible to make it more interesting. There were a lot of other comorbidities like anxiety and depression, GERD, pain because of the joints, and also the psoriasis patients also complain of pain in the skin and sleep disorders and insomnia. And I think we have endocrinologists over here. We have Ravi Shankar here. He will tell you that if there's a sleep disorder and you don't get your adequate amount of REM sleep, then you are going to end up with a metabolic problem. You're going to probably end up with a dyslipidemia, a cardiovascular risk factor, or probably end up with truncal obesity like I have. So rises and the eye, I, one of the hats that I wear is that I work with the Shankar Netralia and I teach at Shankar Netralia. I teach at their UVA clinic. I also work at their cornea clinic. And it's interesting because we are seeing a lot of cutaneous uh, complications of various skin diseases in the eye. We will talk about psoriasis over here. There could be direct cutaneous effects like the eyelid involvement and blepharitis and immune mediated conditions like uveitis. Now, there was an investigation in Singapore. The eye complications are common in Asians, 
and they should be elicited always during history taking. Unfortunately, we find that most dermatologists do not ask the patient about the eye. This is just a picture of how bad the joints can become in a psoriasis patient. And if you look at the radiology of the joints, radiologically, there is complete destruction of the joints. This is the whittling that you see over here. And this is irreversible. And there is some degree of ankylosis also happening at the same time. Dr. Soma Balan has asked me a question. I will just come to that. The Morland Wright classification, there are several classifications of joint involvement. Uh, this is more for dermatologists, but it's more important to understand that we are very worried about the distal interphalangeal joint uh, disease, uh, though it is not so common. It's, uh, it's the asymmetric oligoarthritis, which is very common in psoriasis. But if the DIP joints are involved with so many people wanting to use their hands, it becomes very difficult. And the health-related quality of life suffers. They may even lose their jobs. So what investigations will be useful? Simple tests like the ESR, the C-reactive protein, the rheumatoid factor. Second line tests, if there is joint involvement like HLA B27, hyperuricemia. Uh, all these are simple investigations, but I think we are not going to go much in detail. We're going to talk about something very simple. This is a very, very simple, straightforward picture of a hibiscus. And I'm not going to talk about herbal treatment with hibiscus oil, by the way, but I'm going to come to a very vitally important question. What is the evidence that comorbidities are linked to psoriasis? Have we assumed too much from, from epidemiology? Now, this is partly what Dr. Ravi Shankar asked. The comorbidities of psoriasis, uh, this is where it's going to become a little toxic, but fortunately, it's only about five to six slides. So please bear with me. I will take a minute extra to explain this. I'm very proud to say that this particular paper was by one Sudarshana, Sundar Rajan, and Mohana Priya Arumugam, both Indians based out of India, and they explored the links by the network approach. Now, let's see what is the network approach. Now, this is an integrated system biology approach, which is utilized to decipher the molecular alliance of psoriasis with its comorbidities. There is an unbiased integrative, integrative network medicine methodology, which is adopted for the investigation of a disease home. I will show you what is a disease home for biological processes and pathways of five most common psoriasis associated comorbidities. That is what these authors did. And they found that there was a significant overlap between genes acting in a similar direction in psoriasis and its comorbidities. This is what they found. They also found that the biological processes involved in the inflammatory response and its cell signaling formed a common basis between psoriasis and its associated comorbidities. We've seen a bit of this, and I showed you the shared cytokines between psoriasis and various comorbid conditions. So network medicine is a branch of systems biology. This provides a systematic platform to investigate the molecular intricacy of a disease, which aids the identification of new molecular associations amongst apparently diverse clinical manifestations. In 2003, if I was to go and stand up on the stage and say that if your patient of psoriasis comes, look out for an impending stroke, you would call me a madman. Many people did anyway, and they probably still do. But this is what network medicine does because a so-called diverse clinical manifestation can be linked. I still remember that when I was in Jipma doing internal medicine, Anand, you, you mentioned this, I chucked internal medicine because I found that there was absolutely no uh, attempt towards integrating lines of thought in so-called diverse clinical manifestations. Well, things have changed today and today we are linking diverse clinical manifestations. And then to see the commonality of the genetic expression, you can do meta-analysis, but 
meta analysis that to uh, in psoriasis patients with so many different factors sometimes is a bit flawed now this is a beautiful venn diagram which shows the number of overlapping genes between psoriasis and its comorbidities look at this blue uh, one here psoriasis 507 so 507 genes this entire amoeba like thing is actually the psoriasis uh, uh, picture it overlaps with arthritis it overlaps over here over here it overlaps completely with uh, 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 diseases like bowel diseases it overlaps with atopics it overlaps with obesity and Myocardial infarction genes are also shared over here between psoriasis, arthritis, and uh, 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 cardiac involvement. So we have seen the pathways being the same. We have seen the genetic sharing between psoriasis and various comorbidities. And this is what makes things interesting and gives you a very compelling argument that we are not just you know, uh, talking off the hat, we are talking about something that really does exist, but is probably under-recognized as of now in the wider community. But there are a group of doctors who have looked at it in great detail. The inflammatory skin march occurs even in atopic dermatitis. Anand was very kind enough to credit me with that position in ISAD. Yes, I am there in ISAT, and I have always been interested in pediatric dermatology. Both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are frequently comorbid with cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and autoimmune diseases. What we call as the march of psoriasis, the inflammatory skin march, or the psoriatic march. So, in fact, there is one condition which is called as SEMA, PS, and the last three words of eczema. PSEMA. So that is an overlap between psoriasis and eczema, which we do see in some of our patients, depending upon which gene is active at which stage in the disease, patients may switch from one to the other. This has implications in therapy. I will talk to you about that if you are interested. Now, I told you I will show you what is a disease-ohm. I'm sure you'll be regretting why I told you that when you see this picture. A disease ohm associates, it's a basically a proteomic concept. When people tell me, why do you talk about biologics? I tell them, look, biologics are going to be passe in another two years. You need to get into proteomics now. Now this violet nodes shows the proteins in psoriasis. You can see it's there all over. The red nodes you see are the common proteins shared between MI, that is myocardial infarction and psoriasis. And the dark blue nodes are the indirect interactions. So even through proteomics, we have proved that MI, cardiovascular risk events, cardiovascular uh, stroke events are all shared with psoriasis. And the psoriasis disease of is a much larger spectrum. We really don't know what else is there in uh, you know, clusters like this, for example, or clusters like this, or clusters like this. We have not yet looked at all that because we haven't really gone into that much detail in investigating our psoriasis patients. And one of those things is malignancy. We don't know which cluster is going to predict malignancy. Now, this is another very interesting and easy to understand. Now, when you look at proteomics, you just want to ask me a simple question. Is there a sharing of proteins between psoriasis and comorbid conditions? Simple answer is yes. If you look at the molecular comorbidity index, what you call as the MCI, the total, then over here, there is one. Muli, you're breaking up. Yeah, I know. We've lost our day. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, so uh, this is OMS, then uh, 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 there is uh, just, just one second because I have a problem in my head. So as far as MCI is concerned, you can see over here 
uh, whether it is uh, arthritis, whether it is MI, uh, obesity, di diabetes, or even uh, 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 atopic dermatitis, everything is, uh, is, is, is shared with psoriasis. So this is the molecular comorbidity index. Now there is an overlap of identified biological pathways in the psoriasis disease zone. Uh, once again, if you look at atopic dermatitis, see the big overlap. Type 2 diabetes mellitus, look at the overlap. Myocardial infarction, look at the overlap. Obesity, look at the overlap. Arthritis, look at the overlap. Now, if you look at the proteins which are downgraded, even the proteins which are downgraded are similar to, between psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, diabetes, infarctions, obesity, and rheumatoid arthritis. I don't think we need any more convincing to understand that there is a common pathway and there is something common to all of this that is happening in the body. So that is where you come into metabolomics. Now, in this looks at the metabolism of the body, you're going further down. You've looked at genes, you've looked at uh, the cytokines, you've looked at the clinical uh, associations, and then you go into seeing what is wrong metabolic. Now, as far as the metabolism is concerned, there is a plasma level of amino acids like threonine, leucine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. They were increased in psoriasis, indicating a dysfunctional amino acid metabolism. The level of the amino acid metabolism directly reflects the state of the liver function, the liver cell metabolism. There is therefore abnormal lipid metabolism. Arachidonic acid is increased with the subsequent prostaglin and thromboxin rise. So blood tends to clot. There is increased power. This is very interesting, which we have not token of, talked of till now. There are increased plasma levels of uric acid in psoriasis. We used to dismiss it in many of our patients, but the problem is that this actually is a biomarker for kidney damage in patients with psoriasis. So it's not such an easy disease which you can forget about it and throw away. And these are not from some cock and bull journals. This is the European Review for Medical and Pharmacological Sciences, very highly regarded. So these are all different. So it gives you a completely different perspective in psoriasis vulgaris research. We spoke about TNF-alpha blockers. It can reduce cardiovascular disease risk. Besides the control of inflammation, TNF blockers, they downregulate even fibrinolytic as well as hemostatic parameters. They normalize plated hyperreactivity, reducing the cardiovascular risk. Now, this is the involvement of another set of proteins I spoke to you about, the TH17 axis and the IL-23 cytokines, their link in psoriasis and cardiometabolic disease. I'll just go through this to summarize what's happening. There is local inflammation in the tissue in the skin. There's a crosstalk with the adipose tissue, even with the gums, endothelium, and pancreas. And there are patients with obesity who are much worse, and they end up with NASH. The metabolic syndrome contributes further. The abnormal cholesterol metabolism uh, is once again linked to insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia. All of this contributes to vascular inflammation, hypertension, atherosclerosis. All this contributes to cardiovascular diseases, uh, 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 the thrombi, stroke, transit ischemic attacks, everything is done by one single problem and that is psoriasis. So that's why I brought this all, all into one picture for you. I found this to be extremely useful because I think every physician should know this and not take psoriasis my, uh, like, uh, very lightly. So I'm coming to the end of my discussion with you. Uh, this is uh, one of the usual sunsets. I was lucky to get a good orange ball over there. Last two slides, what have we learned about other comorbids? There is a lot we can keep talking about. I can talk to you for a week 
about this particular topic because I've spent 25 years working on this. We expect the same beneficial effect on other chronic inflammatory disease as well. The improvement in inflammatory bowel disease and arthropathy prevention with biologics is well known. I also told you about how the choice of the biologic is very important. You choose a drug like etanercept, the Crohn's disease gets worse. None of the benefits will accrue to the patient without lifestyle modification. We spoke about obesity. We spoke about NASH. We spoke about the fact that these patients end up with a high CRP. Lifestyle modification is an evolutionary mandate if the human species has to survive. And if not for the appearance of a skin sign like psoriasis, we would never realize the need to connect comorbidity and lifestyle medication. I feel, to end what I'm discussing this with you, that this is an evolutionary gift to man. We should not look upon psoriasis with fear. We should be happy that we are sitting and discussing this because this is an evolutionary gift. As we keep evolving, we get diseases. The diseases teach us something. We've learned something over here. None of my patients goes away without at least a half an hour lecture on lifestyle modification, unless and until lifestyle modification is done. Your biologics are not going to work, nor are the comorbids going to go away. In fact, they're going to kill the patient. In conclusion, and I would like to thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I did have a little break there because, you know, sometimes my brain gets thrown out. So I am late by a minute. It's a multi-system inflammatory disease. The comorbid conditions are varied, but cardiometabolic disease is major and usually ignored by all doctors, especially dermatologists. It's time that we change our outlook towards psoriasis patients. We can modify the systemic complications by treating psoriasis adequately. Most of them can be modified. We need a registry for psoriasis. And I would make, I have tried talking to the dermatologist's body several times, doesn't work. But I can talk to this group over here because this group has taken time off to listen to something. It's a, it's a mixed audience and you are ready to listen to something which is not your field exactly every day. But the point here is that even we can start a registry for psoriasis. All that we need to do is to make people understand that once you start treating patients with psoriasis the way they should be treated, we can improve the overall health-related quality of life of human beings. It's a joke whenever you get married to a dermatologist. It's a very derisive joke that's made, saying that don't worry, along uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the husband, you'll also get a lot of psoriasis patients, so you can never cure them. And with all these psoriasis patients, you will have a nice, happy life. That's a very, very sick statement, which I have heard several times. In fact, when I buzzed off from internal medicine, my professor called me and told me, why do you want to give a good dowry to your daughter? That's what happened to me. Psoriasis is not a dowry you give your daughter. It's high time you understand that psoriasis is a problem. And psoriasis is linked to entire internal medicine. And a person who wants to know internal medicine needs to understand psoriasis. And you treat psoriasis well, you're going to do very well. Thank you extremely, uh, Dr. Vidya. Thank you very much, Dr. Radhakrishna. My, you've all been my wonderful friends. and You've put up with this lecture, but I think time has come to close. Uh, thank you for the very, very kind invitation. And I'll be happy to take on any questions if there are. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Murli, for finishing on time. Uh, over to you, Anand, for your comments and any questions, and then we'll take all the comments and questions from the audience. Yeah, thanks, Murli. Uh, from a dermatology perspective, it's wonderful to listen to Murli because, you know, as he already said, we are like tuned into psoriasis as a multi-system inflammatory disease, and we know where we are heading for. And uh, sometimes I see one of the figures where he showed about interleukin-70 and the 
dendritic cell and i was wondering what happens to non dermatologists who looks at this slide and thinks what are dermatologists doing well dermatology is a lot of immunology today and this is what we've been having from 1980 sometime around 1980s this immunology concept dermatology and it's just wonderful to hear murli go through a lot of things of course a lot of new things which i learned too a new uh, terms about what is that mebonomics something like that. <laughs> new terms which something sometimes uh, helps understand the disease as he said it needs a lot of interaction uh, with the internist to go i just give an example i had a 24 year old psoriatic patient recently a 24 year old you don't expect him to have any problems his triglycerides were 480 his cholesterol was 280 his insulin level was sky high and he was not obese he was just a normal looking guy it was a shock to the family that you know all these uh, markers were very very high so as murli said there is a lot in psoriasis than what goes on the surface of the skin and yes i personally do have psoriasis myself and my mother had psoriasis what interesting thing is when i started running the marathon my psoriasis disappeared kind of completely so that goes and you know i may be lean but my triglycerides were high now it's normal so there is a strong link in all these genetic patterns as you already explained uh, thanks i think i will leave since it's more for the non dermatologist i'll allow the other people to ask questions to murli so uh, murli do you want to take the comments and questions on the chat first yeah i can do that i would first like to really thank uh, everybody a lot of uh wonderful people have uh, written nice things i'm extremely grateful thank you very much for putting that out there and vidya thank you again um uh, ravi shankar's question hepatology paper 2009s were the controls matched for obesity yes they were uh then there's a question from dr suma balan um pediatric psoriasis is an extremely neglected area what do you think about the necessity for rheumatologists and dermatologists working together dr suma there are two uh, parts over here uh, you see my mandate was not to talk about pediatrics or rhesus today and i do agree completely with you that it is a very neglected area and uh, we need to do a lot more uh, even in fact most of the trials on most of the new drugs are not used in pediatric patients or it's not given in pediatric patients but that is more because of the uh, 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 technicality and the process by which a drug trial is being done but as far as the behavior of pediatric psoriasis is concerned it is not grossly different from what happens to an adult patient but yes i take your point that it is relatively neglected and we need to do more uh, what we have a rheumatology and dermatology clinic uh rheuma derma clinics are there in fact i have conducted master classes of rheuma derma interfaces and uh, we do work together yes in fact uh, it is uh, very important that we work together because uh, uh, many times we find that the rheumatologists may suspect psoriatic arthritis but they need a dermatologist to uh, confirm it for them so that's uh, as far as uh, this thing and i'm just uh, once one second yes ravi shankar uh, yes ravi shankar um, uh, you have gone through the kaiser permanent uh, database the kaiser permanent database is maintained by an extremely good friend of mine dr jashin wu there are very many other seawats uh, in cirrhosis uh i had to confine myself primarily to the cardio metabolic uh, complications and issues uh but uh, we have uh, in, uh, jashin bu and myself we've written a paper on this also and yes uh, we have uh, written a lot about this and uh, it is there in the database and we are up updating the database regularly uh then there is uh, i'm just Now, there is one question uh, which is a direct question which is about scalp psoriasis um i won't take any names or anything over here 
which suggests that, you know, as far as scalp psoriasis is concerned, just because it is a small patch, please do not neglect it. Uh, having scalp psoriasis is one of the markers that one might develop arthro arthropathy. There is a higher association of uh, systemic comorbidities with scalp psoriasis, gluteal cleft psoriasis, and nail psoriasis. So it should be treated. And uh, there is, yeah, someone has said that as a cardiologist, I will remind myself about psoriasis when I see my MI patients. That's nice to hear. Should statins be used prophylactically? That's a wonderful question from Dr. Purnima Dar. Um, I think when we talk about this over here, we're not talking about using it in uh, psoriasis patients, but whether you should use it prophylactically uh, to prevent the dyslipidemia, which is eventually going to occur. Uh, I'm actually happy you asked that question, Dr. Purnima, because uh, as of now, the current project in both the Mayo uh, and in um, uh, the uh, Texas uh, Dallas Center, which I projected the first two slides, is they are looking at the different biomarkers to try and translate what we know from the uh, genetics of psoriasis and the immunology of psoriasis to see whether you can preempt some of the problems that patients are going to need. Uh, there are a lot of pros and cons regarding the usage of uh, statins, even without psoriasis, but uh, by and large, the uh, advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. So I wouldn't be surprised if somebody tells you that uh, maybe two years down the line, we come out with the recommendation. And if I am still in the IPC, I may be part of that. Now, there's one question from Dr. Pratibha. Uh, in psoriatic patients with hypertriglyceridemia and raised HbA1c hypothyroidism, what should be the base of treatment in otherwise non-comorbid and normal body structure? The, you see, the, the thing is, uh, uh, when there is, a, now, uh, if the patient is, uh, now, now let me take it as, uh, you will have to break this down. Uh, Mere presence of dyslipidemia, it is not mandatory for you to start the patient on a biologic. But a dyslipidemia is usually associated with the fatty liver. It is also usually associated with problems with the liver enzymes. So you should be a little careful about using probable hepatotoxic drugs like acetretin or methotrexate. Uh, so that's something you should be careful about. Now, when you look and you see that there could probably be joint involvement also in such patients, what we need to understand is that the conventional drugs for psoriasis uh, do not prevent ankylosis of the joints. And uh, they worsen the osteoporosis that occurs around the joints. Uh, so over that is a situation where at the earliest sign of joint involvement, you need to start a patient on a biologic but for the reason of cost and economics, sometimes it becomes difficult. Um, in fact, I would say that if a patient has uh, hypertriglyceridemia, one should follow what Dr. Anand uh, said. I mean, I told you that in, uh, when, when we counsel our patients of psoriasis, we insist on, on for fitness. If Anand runs a marathon, he gets rid of the hypertriglyceridemia and he also gets the psoriasis under control. Exercise brings down the severity of inflammation in the body. So lifestyle modification is very, very important. So Dr. Vidya, I have, go I think I have finished the yeah. question from the chat box. So uh, Ravi has his hand up. Uh, what do you want to say, Ravi? Oh, no, I was going to ask another question. Uh, Murli had started his talk by putting those slides from um, his collaborator in Dallas about, uh, you know, phenotypic, genotypic correlations, as well as ultimate treatment, uh, you know, decisions based on the genes involved. So is there anything, um, uh, you know, more on that? Or do all, all these genes feed into these common uh, pathways starting with uh, TNF uh, um, activation. Thank you, Ravi. Um, yes, this uh, uh, the, uh, I, I, I showed you 
the disease I showed you the proteome. I also showed you the genetic, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 overlaps uh, and the correlation. Uh, what we need to know now is that what would be the best possible or the minimum possible uh, tests which are available in the blood to help you to look for these correlations or treat proactively. And that work is going on right now. Uh, I did make a very brief mention of it. That work is going on. The work going on in psoriasis today is to look for good biomarkers which can be done in one sample of blood and which can tell you how the life course is going to be over the next 10 years. Um, can I also ask another question? I mean, you talked about the uh, relationship with inflammatory bowel disease and type 2 diabetes. What about type 1 diabetes, which is a, um, uh, you know, I mean, some people claim that it's an inflammatory disease and not truly an endocrine disease. I mean, I have issues with that, but particularly um, type 1 diabetes. What are the overlaps between psoriasis and we type 1 diabetes? Frankly, not found an overlap as of mm -hmm. yet. No, uh, okay. As of yet, we have not yet found an overlap. Murli, my eyes. Yes. See, one of the problem with genetics and psoriasis is to call psoriasis a single disease itself is wrong. Exactly. It's that, you know, there's so many poly. I'll just give you an illustrate an example. I had a patient in 1996 who first came to me when he was 20 years old. He had a single nail psoriasis. And uh, I told him this is psoriasis. He was shocked and surprised. Six months later, he had multiple nail psoriasis. Those days, the only treatment was to inject intralesionally into the nails. And this guy consented and we did inject him. Fortunately, I say fortunately, because there's not no certainty that he's going to get cured by intralesional injection. He got cured. 2006, he comes to me with psoriasis of the palms and the soles. Right? And this is a different type of psoriasis. This time, he's diabetic. He has got triglyceridemia and the cholesterol. So you have to change your lifestyle. So he started playing shuttle and everything instead. In 2009, he came with arthritis and scalp psoriasis. And he brought his daughter along who had different type of psoriasis. You see, that phenotypically, there is so much of variation that you cannot pinpoint a particular gene and say, this is the gene which is causing this type of psoriasis. So that's why... It's far too early to start a very, very specific targeted treatment. Right now, we have wonderful biologics, which work commonly for, as Murli said, for the inflammatory bowel disease, as well as the psoriasis. But we cannot predict whether this patient is going to be linked to one particular comorbidity or multiple comorbidities. It's very difficult. It's phenotypically different type of conditions and genotypically also different. Right now, we are finding one each day, we are finding a new gene for psoriasis. I appreciate what uh, you said that there are so many uh, coming up and uh, the story is not yet over. The simple long and short of it is that the story yeah. is not yet over. And uh, it is only now that these newer tools of network analysis has started. And once we complete that, we will know what are the genes that are really important. Um, may I take two questions that have come up over here, Dr. Vidya? I'll go right ahead. Before that, if Dr. Elizabeth wanted to say something, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Parameshwar. I'm afraid, no, I had not uh, put any question up. No, I had not. Okay. Go ahead, we take the questions on the chat. Hello. Can I ask you a question? Go right ahead. Uh, Dr. Murli, it was an excellent talk on, uh, I'm a nephrologist, and I see patients with psoriasis getting IgA nephropathy, it's being uh, re recorded. You mentioned about uric acid, because IgA NS again has a high uric acid, uh, it indicates. And at present, it said the uh, psoriasis lesion is more than 3%, but 20% of them will get renal disease. And you, you extensively covered the cardiac problems. I thought uh, uh, this is the renal problems are also equally common. I and totally recently, agree. they have reported uh, C3 uh, glomerulopathy, which involves the alternate pathway of complements uh, in psoriasis. So I would like to know from you uh, how exactly this is happening. 
So the drug so is a direct inflammatory reaction or immunological reaction. Yeah, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Raman, I'm sorry, I did not talk too much about uh, every organ. For example, I did not talk about the lung. In fact, uh, interstitial lung disease is very common in psoriasis. And, you know, we, uh, but it's because I had to stick to that 45 minutes. And in that 45 minutes, I lost one minute because I <laughs> had a little seizure. Yeah, I had a seizure. What's the big deal? Everybody knows I have seizures. When I talk, sometimes I go into an absence. But uh, when it comes to the renal issues, we are aware about the renal issues. We are aware about increased incidence of IgA nephropathy in psoriasis patients. And uh, we do, in my patients, I do look at the urine sediment carefully. I don't dismiss it. I look at the uh, renal functions properly in every one of my patients because even the conventional drugs are going to have a bearing to play on the kidneys. And uh, as far as the mechanism, pathomechanism is concerned, it is purely immunological. Uh, C3 and uh, C3C uh, is very easily documented in psoriasis and activated in psoriasis. And the uh, whole complement cascade can uh, bear down in uh, psoriasis patients. Should I take a question, Dr. Vidya? Yes, please go right ahead. Yeah, there's uh, one uh, of an association of vaccination and expression of psoriasis, uh, specifically COVID vaccination. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, the reason being that uh, psoriasis worsens uh, during COVID. So it is not recommended to stop any of the medications for psoriasis if a patient develops COVID. Of course, patients of psoriasis are not treated with steroids, but if the COVID needs steroids, go ahead and give it and manage the psoriasis later. That's number one. But the vaccination is a different uh, ball game altogether because there have been reports of the vaccination flaring up psoriasis patients. So, but unfortunately, since there is a pandemic which might claim, which has already claimed 5 million lives in the world as of today, uh, one should go ahead with the vaccination and uh, one should not hold it back just because the patient has psoriasis. There may be a flare-up. I agree with you on that. Uh, the flare-ups would be more likely with uh, the mRNA vaccines and uh, yes, it can happen. The, there's another question from Dr. Suma Balan. As a pediatric rheumatologist, I have never needed so far to use biologics for my psoriatic arthritis patients, except for the ones who have axial disease. I totally agree with you, Dr. Suma, on that. I guess we use higher doses of methotrexate in rheumatology compared to dermatology. This is a very interesting point, which of course I have discussed more in dermatology forums, but I, this is a good forum to talk about it. The liver in rheumatologic diseases is different from the liver in dermatologic diseases. If you look at a pure rheumatological problem, let's say, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, the incidence of NASH is much lower than what we see in a psoriasis patient who is naive to any uh, hepatotoxic drug in the past. So it is quite likely that you can use much higher doses. We see our rheumatologist friends using uh, definitely higher doses of methotrexate compared to what dermatologists use. Ravi, Dr. Ravi Shankar has asked about whether any of the biologics are indicated in patients less than 18 years. Answer is yes. Uh, once we had Dr. Amy Paller join the IPC, she did a lot of work in Northwestern University and uh, she's a pediatric dermatologist and uh, adalimumab, that is uh, Humira in the West and Etanercept. Uh, have all been uh, used six years of age and above, and there are some more undergoing trials. And I add also morally that, you know, I was once in a forum with Alan Mentor, where he showed me pictures of pregnancy and biologics, and he says nothing happens in the outcome. The biologics yes. are used in pregnancy, so yes, it's true. Yes, they are used. 
Uh, 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 Ghosh, would you like to say something, Amit Ghosh? Thank you. Um, what I'll start by saying is, I think internal medicine's loss is dermatologist's gain. Um, and that's what Dr. Murli Dharan just demonstrated. With the use of uh, big data and different abilities to do research, store data, look at it, all these different proteins, genes, and how they interplay is going to transform, transform uh, medicine. Uh, one is not very sure the psoriasis is what we are focusing on. There are other diseases like HIV where you have an explosive case of psoriasis and others. So one doesn't know whether one is proceeding with a common pathway uh, of all these changes going on. And then they manifest either as HIV or HIV with psoriasis or psoriasis and, and the other diseases. So it's a, it's a complete potpourri of thing which comes up and once the body is riled up, and that's what, what Dr. Anand says, you know, exercising decreases inflammation and most of us either will never do it or knowing well, we cannot do it because of arthritis. But having said that, um, uh, I was most amazed by Dr. Uh, Rajgopalan's empathy for patients with psoriasis, the intensity with which he spends time, which is so very rare, I must say, among not only among dermatologists, but among all the physicians, um, that that is probably transforming healthcare. So it's good to do research, good to do metabolics, but those are just identification of processes. But what you see in front of you, the patient, uh, is very important and that empathy needs to be uh, and has been highlighted by Dr. Murli. One of the things which I would say for marvelous medicine and for dermatology in particular, which I'm seeing in US is using slides from Western population, uh, white people, because of the diversity, we would like to see more slides of Indians who are having psoriasis, people of color having psoriasis, because it tends to imply that there is importance of this disease only in particular race. And given the diversity uh, talk, I would, uh, I would just request that the slides be more towards your own population because these diseases are missed in Indian population and other because there is a plaque here and plaque there and that's thought about as a ring bomb. White in a white population is easy to pick up. So that's just a side comment, but I'm seeing uh, almost everybody changing their slides, pathology, dermatology, uh, based on um, the racial inequity which has been judged. But apart from that, I, I comment uh, Dr. Raj Gopal, and I'm sure if you have to give this talk in another two years, it'd be a completely different talk. The slides would look the same, the skin lesions would look the same, but what you would talk about therapeutics, uh, pathophysiology will change and that's good progress. So I don't think at any point we can say we know everything about the disease. The more humble way of saying is that it's just like an iceberg um, underwater and only the tip is there. And as we know more and more, the level of the water seems to be going down and more of the tip is coming up. But regardless, I completely comment, uh, Dr. Anand, not, if you could all be like you, uh, be running and um, doing things which you do, I tell you, uh, 85, 90% of our problems will not be there, uh, period. That's, that's probably the mantra which you preached and thank you for that. Uh, Bala, did you want to say something? I saw you turning on your camera, Bala. <laughs> Thank you, dear. <clears throat> Muli, that was a very wonderful one, yeah. But uh, the cardiologists and uh, dermatologists having in common connection with uh, psoriasis. Uh, I think I take your point very well. All uh, dermatologists must be a good internist. And next time, when I see my patients, I'll definitely look about psoriasis. It is a new perspective I learned from you. Thank you very much. A great talk, Murli. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Adhya. Over to you. Uh, uh, Murli, there is a question about alternative systems like homeopathy and Ayurveda. Is, yeah. Are there any results? Yes, I'll... I'm going to blow up his talk. <laughs> uh, 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 first of all, uh, Dr. Vidya, uh, I would just like to answer Dr. Amit Ghosh. Uh, Dr. Ramit, I just, you know, today's lecture, I totally take your point that I have, I mean, I run the, I mean, you know, my CV was not read out to you. I, in fact, run the Global Psoriasis Atlas for the Asia-Pacific region. And we have the biggest collection of uh, psoriasis 
uh, patches in disease in skin of color. I didn't use those slides only because we am not addressing a dermatology population, but uh, we are addressing a diverse population. And the idea was not to teach psoriasis in the skin, but psoriasis in the internal organs. And but I take your point. Uh, and thank you very much for the kind words you mentioned. And it's great to touch base with you again, Amit, from PGI days. Again, we are back here. Uh, Raj, Dr. Raj Kishore Bhagdi is a very good friend of mine. And uh, um, I hope you're doing well, sir, in uh, Mumbai now. Uh, he has asked the question on alternative systems, homeopathy, Ayurveda, and their results. The simple answer to this is that I think we do not know enough to comment about it in a very, uh, uh, I, I, I would say, hard-hitting manner, one way or the other. Um, the only thing that has been done is that Johns Hopkins has done a couple of trials on homeopathy and found that it was not better than uh, placebos. But uh, whether they did it exactly in psoriasis or not is something it, I have to check. But as far as Ayurveda is concerned, I have had patients who have improved with Ayurveda and I have had patients who have not improved. We need to know why they did not improve. We also need to know why they improve. So the problem is that if you could have the same slide rule, which is going to measure the effect of Ayurveda or uh, Yunani or homeopathy and allopathy, and measure it in the same manner, in the proper way, I think we'll have a better answer to you, sir. As of now, um, whatever I say will be empirical. Can I add on this? Go right ahead, Anand. You are the moderator. Yeah. Go right ahead. Yeah. So one of the issues with alternate medicine is one is there's a total trust when a patient goes for alternate medicine, as opposed to a patient trusting the modern medicine. I wouldn't call it allopathy. Let us call it modern medicine. So what happens in homeopathy is way back in 1860, Murli will know it, Fowler's solution was tincture arsenic. was a wonderful treatment for psoriasis. And very soon we realized that arsenic causes cancer. The patient's psoriasis went away, but then he comes back years later with squamous cell carcinoma all over, his, all over his body, right? And Fowler's solution was formally it was. There were advertisements peddling Fowler solution as a wonder cure for uh, psoriasis. Now in homeopathy, if you look at it, I had to go and read these things in homeopathy as to what they do. One of the treatment is, it's the tincture arsenicum is the treatment for psoriasis. As they say, like cures like. So arsenic produces psoriasis like lesion. So give arsenic, psoriasis goes away. Fine, according to homeopathy, you dilute it so many times that there is no trace of the urinal and supposed to charge the water. That's their, that's their take on the water. But most of the homeopaths in India dish out their own homeopathy medicine. Remember that. All they need to do is tweak the mother tincture a little bit here and there, and the arsenic level goes up. Right? And that's what happens to you. And what happens? Yes, psoriasis does disappear. Some people come back and say, I am sometimes more worried when the patient's psoriasis clears with an alternate system of medicine. This is my, not a, it may be a biased view, but I'm more worried when alternate system of medicine cures a disease without a validation of their potential or what is there. How is it? It's not validated. There is no study in validation. And more important, why is the person giving his own medicine rather than write something from the pharmacy. If it's homeopathy, let him buy from the pharmacy. But he usually dishes out this medicine at exorbitant price. I would rather give a biologic for that price and cure the psoriasis. That's my take on this. Do you have anything to add, Murli, to that? Well, I think it's a question of having a uniform validation and uh, the scientific principle is not uh, uh, different for different systems of medicine. It's the rationale of scientific thinking has to be same. So only then we can actually answer this. I, had a I have three cases of uh, three cases of squamous cell carcinoma arising out of homeopathy treatment given for psoriasis. 
Yeah, I mean, any anything uh, with the alternative medicine um, is bound to raise <laughs> a lot of uh, um, people's uh, uh, you know temperatures, depending on which side of the coin you fall on. But I think Moodley's point is the is the most important one that before we say anything, uh, you know, that is the only way we can come up come to a scientific conclusion and not an emotional one is to have Why studies. Uh, yeah, we, we need to have studies done in the same way that um, you know modern medicine or modern treatments are evaluated. The same type of uh, assessments, the same outcome measures, the same blinding, the same everything. Um, uh, the only question that I have, uh, you know, uh, in in theory that's that's really wonderful, but in practice it may not be that easy because I would love to know which uh, um, IRB is going to permit a study with uh, arsenic uh, being applied to a patient, knowing fully well that it could cause, um, you know, some cancerous lesions uh, eventually. So it may not be possible to do these studies. So. Um, you know, answers may never come. Um, um, so, uh, you know, you just have to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, your, uh, your point is well taken, uh, Ravi. Uh, if uh, if uh, no one has any other Hello, questions, Sophia? yeah, go right ahead. I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm extending. It's, uh, it's not a question. It's just that, you know, I think it's uh, one aspect that we did not discuss, but I did mention is that uh, psoriasis by itself is a disorder which can lead to lymphoma. So the, if the amount of immune dysregulation is severe enough, a patient of psoriasis may end up with lymphoma or even a non-melanoma skin cancer. So uh, I, I, I would take psoriasis a lot more seriously. Uh, when Ravi was talking about uh, cancer, I just thought I should bring this point up because uh, many a drug, even drugs like cyclosporin, have been blamed, saying that, you know, this will produce a lymphoma, don't use this, but actually it is the primary disease. Inflammation after some time destroys immune surveillance. And when inflammation destroys immune surveillance, anything can happen. Yeah, I was actually coming back to you, uh, Murli. If no one had any questions, I thought you could give your uh, closing comments. My closing comment is uh, I am regarding psoriasis. Uh, when I started uh, practice, I didn't think much of psoriasis. Today, I am fabulously humbled by psoriasis because I know that there is so much. And if you really know your psoriasis well, in the, you know, dermatologists used to keep uh, harping saying that. Uh, if you know syphilis, you know medicine. I would say that if you know psoriasis, you know uh, entire medicine. Um, I think psoriasis is going to give us a lot of insights into the future because not only have we uh, found ways to give personalized targeted therapy and precision medicine, not only have we found methods to predict uh, comorbid conditions which could alter the quality of life and probably even the uh, duration of life. Uh, it has uh, brought us back to uh, earth and uh, we realize that fitness exercise, I've made a specific point to mention that psoriasis is an evolutionary gift to mankind. One needs to understand that uh, if you uh, look at psoriasis well and understand it well, uh, your life can definitely improve. And uh, there is so much work going on. This is the space to be in for a good dermatologist for the next few years. Inflammation in the skin is the space where you're going to see a lot of changes happening. And what we have now, we are realizing, even if it is concerned with the uh, uh, with the uh, BioLates, uh, even there we are able to find that there is a difference in the uh, effect of the different drugs in different people, uh, which is why now the, uh, the uh, genomics is playing a big role. So what is right for me may not be right for you. So psoriasis mm -hmm. has taught us that 
in uh, very big bold letters. So it's a very humbling experience to sit and practice psoriasis. It's not such an easy experience. It's a very humbling experience. That's an even more humbling experience to sit and discuss some of these aspects of psoriasis with a bunch of elite uh, non-dermatologists like what happened today. <laughs> That's a very, very humbling experience. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Radha Krishna, what are your takeaways as a surgeon uh, from this? Uh, or do you want any clarification from Murli? No, it's, it's a pleasure listening to Murli. And as you say, I keep hearing everywhere that, you know, in your class is one genius. You know, for, I mean, it's nice to hear geniuses. And actually, I met up with one dermatologist in Shillong long ago. And I just made a mention. Oh, see, suddenly her face started glowing. See, he's my teacher. I mean, the, the respect which he had uh, was such. Now, um, you know, the, in, in spite of being in a corporate sector where there is uh, not so much room for academics, uh, I, I'm surprised how he is into, uh, you know, some elite uh, organizations across the world because anybody in the corporate sector will be always bothered about uh, how is how is money is filling his pockets rather than how academics are coming up and uh, this is something is a very unique thing actually i think uh, wherever a diamond is recognized uh, whichever way uh, it's presented now as a, a lay person i always understood this dermatology is something uh, you know people harboring a very grotesque uh, um, unsightly uh, non photogenic lesions and uh, you know, either itching or oozing, and at times contagious. You know, this is what uh, a general population. And but then when I come to know that <coughs> these are associated with some serious systemic illnesses, that's a lot more scary. <coughs> and uh, I think it's time for every uh, physician and surgeon, uh, what they saw, to uh, take to these things uh, in much more seriously and try uh, understand the the plethora of diseases associated and I think this is a little bit of an eye-opening like you know many of the marvelous medicine lectures that I open uh, that uh, and it's always nice to uh, you know, uh, listen to a classmate of yours who's done so very well. Thank you so much Murli for this wonderful Thank you RK. Um, uh, thank you Murli and thank you uh, Anand for joining us and uh, thank you to all the uh, audience who logged in and uh, and uh, uh, made the session so interactive. I, I, Murli may not have even got so many questions given he spoke to dermatologists, uh, a wide variety of questions. And uh, Ravi Shankar, thank you, uh, uh, Amit, always uh, for participating and keeping the discussion going. Uh, next week, we'll be taking a break. Uh, so we won't be having any session for Marvelous Medicine on the 13th of January. We'll be back on 20th of January with uh, yet another episode of Marvelous Medicine and with the Omicron raging, I request all of you to stay safe uh, and a happy new year once again. Thank you all for joining. Good night and stay safe. Thank you, Vidya. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.